Good morning from Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester. Panhandle Outdoors, your source for fishing, hunting, and information for folks who enjoy the great outdoors. Now sit back, relax. It's Panhandle Outdoors. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Panhandle Outdoors. I'm Winston Chester. I'm glad you're here this morning. We've got a great show lined up. We'll get started with our weather brought to us by Haney Technical Center at Baldwin Road and Highway 77. First thing I noticed in the weather, our water temperature has gone down one degree. We talked about maybe all this cool weather and all coming in, and it did go down one degree. It's not a big thing, but it did go down one degree. High today, though, air-wise, it'll be 81 degrees and low not 64. So it's going to be a pretty day. We're finally getting some spring-like weather. Our river region, taking a look at the Appalachian Coal at Blountstown, it's really, folks, it's getting up there. It, we're at 13.1 this morning, and by the weekend, we're looking at by Saturday, it's getting close to 15 feet, so it's going to be on the rise. Yesterday, we said it's going to be dropping. That's how quick it changed. The chalk to hatch at Caraville. Now, on the other hand, it's going to be falling out this weekend. It's, going to, it's reading us right at 7.9 this morning, and by, by Friday and Saturday, it's going to be uh, down to uh, about 7 foot. So uh, we're in good shape. With our, if you want to fish rising water, go to Appalachia Cove. If you want to fish falling water, Go down to uh, over to Choctaw Hatchet. All right, let's take a look at our tithes brought to us by Kent Forest Lawn Cemetery and Funeral Home. It is one of the uh, uh, situations today. We have a high tide. We're looking at 8:56 today. Of course, it's Thursday. We're looking on that second Thursday of May. We're looking at uh, 8:56. A, a, high, a, a high tide and low tide is going to be tonight at 7:16. So it's falling out pretty fast. In fact, this weekend going to be some really strong tides uh, all weekend. So we've got a really good situation with our tides. Our marine forecast now today will be coming out of southwest, <laughs> believe it or not, at 10 to 15. Southwest at 10 to 15. It keeps on blowing. All right, let's take a break. We'll be right back with our guest. All right, welcome back. And Lieutenant Stan Kirkland. Good morning. Good morning, Winston. Great to have you. Now, we got we have a video of the stand brought. We're going to show that a little bit later, talk about it a little bit later, but we got some other things to talk about first. So let's go ahead and get started. Stan. Well, an announcement this week, Winston, on a new species of uh, bass that's been found in the Chipola River. Uh, we, we've known about this for a couple of years, but it had to go through some genetic reviews and, and all. It was uh, a paper was presented earlier this year, uh, so we've just made the announcement. It, it looks... Uh, very similar to the, or looks uh, uh, similar to the spotted bass that's found in the Chipola River, but this is called the, we're, we're proposing to name it the Choctaw bass uh, based on the, the uh, Choctaw Indians that were in the, much of the southeastern United States. Um, it, that, that name has to be approved by the American Fishery Society, but uh, uh, kind of exciting news. Uh, well, that is, and it's, yeah. it's just in one river system, you think? Well, it's, uh, I know it's in the Chipola. I don't know if it's any other systems, but I'm going to get uh, Chris to come on one day. Okay, good. Chris Paxton, and uh, maybe I can uh, talk more about that. But we have, you know, these rock systems that we have, uh, those shoals in the Chipola River. Yeah. Uh, you just don't see that in most of our river systems here in Florida. That's, that's just so unique. And, of course, you can't boat the whole Chipola, but... Uh, they've done a lot of, um, Chris and his staff, uh, uh, Katie uh, Woodside and Nicole Curl, they've done a lot of work on there, uh, and um, uh, they've, they've been able to look at a lot of different uh, things in that, that river system, Chipola River. Some of them really good, some of them not so good, because we got places where people are allowing cattle to, uh -huh. to go into the river, uh, destroying the stream bank, and so they've been trying to work with some some of these landowners to maybe keep the cattle off the banks because what happens is you get siltation, uh, destroys the stream bank, yeah. and, and uh, it's not good for the eggs or any of the um, any anything inside in the system. So you anyway, know, I, you know, I consider you know the Panhandle is special, but within the Panhandle we have treasures at different places. Oh, we I do. consider the Chipola one of our treasures. At well, Panhandle. you look at not only the Chipola, the yeah. Apalachicola yeah. River. Uh, you know, it, when you read back, uh, I, I was reading a book this past uh, uh, year about steamboat travel on the yeah. Appalachicola River uh, back in the, the 1800s. Uh, when, when you look at, um, you know, I, I was reading about, uh, you know, in, uh, Native Americans or Indian attacks on, on uh, people bringing uh, yeah. uh, boats up mm -hmm. the river in, in Weewahichka and, 
and, and you know, over in Chattahoochee. Exactly. In fact, there was one person abducted. A lady was abducted, uh, and and uh, and her her husband and a group finally caught up with the group and got her back over. Um, I forget now over near Perry, yeah. but uh, anyway, it, it's just fascinating if you know the history of this area and you're willing to read. Our yeah. library, local library, has an excellent book on the steamboat travel, on, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden the name of that book escapes me. It's a big book, but yeah. you can actually uh, yeah, uh, read. Yeah, our, our, our treasure right. of history is fascinating, right. too. So it, it, it is. It is. Okay, you got what else you got? Uh, the other thing I was going to mention, Winston, is there's a on May the fifteenth. Now the time is uh, uh, the the cutoff. I think is this Friday, uh, uh, day after tomorrow. But if you want to attend the Lone Leaf Pine workshop uh, put on uh, uh, by the Lone Leaf Alliance in Mariana, and we're a partner in that. That's on. Uh, that's coming up May fifteenth at the uh, Ag Center there in Mariana. Okay. Um, the, you, everything they're going to be talking about everything from economic benefits of planting longleaf pine, wildlife benefits, uh, uh, what to do about burning, and those sorts of things. So anyway, good now, stuff. You, you, you mentioned we we're talking about before the uh, show how many million acres of pine right. we had at one time. More than ninety million acres of longleaf pine, uh, and it was the predominant. Uh, forest species in the southeastern United States. In fact, there are photos, uh, books, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, e. E. Carswell, who mm -hmm. was well known in this area and uh, an author, I think has a book. I look, was looking at one of his books. I, I wished I had a copy of it. I think it's out of print, but mm -hmm. it, he had some black and whites from the, I think it was the late 1880s and 1890s before Northwest Florida was logged. And these were trees that you couldn't reach around, lonely pines, and it went from 90 million acres uh, through the heyday of the uh, timber timber industry in the mm -hmm. 1800s down to as few as about 3 million acres. And, and it was literally one of the most critically endangered forest species that we have. Uh, but today they're coming, uh, people are planting longleaf pine. They realize the benefits and getting away from uh, from some of these pine species that are that were not native to the southeastern United States. And so uh, today they're up to about four million acres. I was talking to Ed Platt uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, and and in fact I'll, I'm looking forward to attending as well and just learning. Yeah, that sounds like a lot yeah. of fun. So yeah. y'all, they, if they want to go, they just need to and, call. And, and economic, and also they're they're going to be talking about economic incentive programs that are available to you, the landowner. So if you've got 250 acres or 500 acres, and you want to and you want to you're thinking about getting out, uh, getting away from some of these other pine species for uh, that that uh, don't grow as fast. Uh, you may want to you may want to attend. Sound like fun, right? But right. They, they call the FWC office or no, they no. Call they call uh, they, they can go on on. Uh, they can call the Department of Ag there, uh, Florida Department of Ag there in Miana. Uh, we've got the phone number. We can give it to people okay. if they want to call our office. But you register uh, there in Miana. All right, sounds good. All right, let's take a break and we'll be right back. Ah, welcome back. Now we're going to change subjects from pine trees and, and workshops and all to to another uh, to an ugly subject. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> tell us. Tell us. We got a video coming up. Tell us a little well, bit of background. Well, a, a few weeks ago we had a call from uh, some local people that uh, they had a they had uh, a South American lizards coming up in their yard, and it was kind of a a scene that uh, is hard to imagine for most people, but a a person who lived uh, in the Cedar Grove area, uh, on, uh, actually on Cedar Lane, um, had um, had a permit, a Class Three permit from us uh, to sell uh, tegus. These are Argentine black and white tegus. Uh, here's a picture of them. Yeah, right here. this tegus. is what they look like. And uh, this is not a little animal. These <laughs> things can get up to um, uh, about five feet. Now, the biggest I think we had we saw was four feet. But uh, these things are up to 30 pounds or so. Very strong jaws. Uh, very uh, uh, have the ability to bite and uh, can 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 uh, uh, could could inflict serious damage to yeah. somebody that didn't know what they're doing. If you notice, the person holding that one was wearing some substantial gloves mm -hmm. uh, to prevent injury. They're very fast. They have short legs. Very fast. But this person had left the area, and we don't know why he left. All we know is he abandoned these animals. Uh, we we uh, are pretty sure that he abandoned them last winter, early winter, 
uh, late fall into the winter when these things were in the ground. They actually had, uh, he had created, created burrows for them down in the ground so they could survive the winter. Uh, if, he, if they didn't have, they can withstand down to about 35 degrees. So what, what the person had done was dig some burrows, uh, cover these burrows with wood and, and uh, burlap and, and carpet and junk, and then, and then the, uh, so the uh, tegus could go into the ground, okay. spend the, hibernate essentially, or uh, I'm not sure if hibernate or estivate's the word, but they go into the ground, they uh, spend the winter, and then, uh, of course, he moved off. They got new tenants there. Uh, the new tenants uh, were told that there was something in the ground, but they really didn't know what. And then, and then come March and, and uh, first week of two of April, all of a sudden, they've got a yard full of lizards, big <laughs> lizards, four foot lizards. And so uh, when they noticed what they had, and of course they had a fence around the yard, but the gate was open, they were going and coming. So you can imagine this was kind of a uh, accident waiting to happen. And uh, we got involved, when we found out about it, got involved, uh, investigator Jerry Shores and some of his staff, other staff with agency have been involved in this. They've caught, uh, a, a, as of this past week, they had caught 34. 34? 34, and uh, these were, uh, like I say, some of these guys, uh, I made a photo of one that's every big as big as that one on the uh, cover of that uh, brochure uh, that we caught the day I was down there. Um, they weren't being fed, they were hungry, emaciated. We, we have a criminal investigation and we anticipate charging this person when we locate them, uh, that, that abandon them. But, um, you know, the point of, of all this and getting the word out, and people understand that they're, they're not native and people don't panic, you know, uh, people have common sense. But the point of all this is, is when you bring in non-natives, when you bring in these exotics, and uh, Florida has su such a subtropical climate you know, we don't get down into the five and 10 degree, or, or, or if it does, it's very, very rare. I, I mean, I can remember it once or twice in the last 30 years that it got that cold. But for the most part, Florida doesn't get cold enough to prevent exotics from getting a foothold. And these exotics can breed, they can um, uh, produce uh, uh, colonies, and we already have that. These yeah. animals are already established now. These same Argentine black and white tegus are already established uh, uh, in Polk County, Hillsborough County, the Miami-Dade area. We have a control effort going on trying to control these things. And so, uh, you, know, uh, we, you know, we've got Burmese python pro uh, issues in South Florida. Mm -hmm. And most of these problems with these bigger um, reptiles and, 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 and all are, are in South Florida. Mm -hmm. But that's not to say that these can't be established here. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're going to a lot of effort, a lot of time and money and expense to make sure these things don't get a foothold. And I, you know, we've had residents in the area. They're, they're very appreciative of the efforts mm -hmm. of staff to go down there. We've still got traps out. Last week, um, uh, it was very cold, if you remember. Yeah. It, we had a front, uh, kind of an unusual front to move in. And so these things being uh, cold-blooded, uh, they hunker down. They don't. They don't move around. And so we, you know, all the efforts last week were pretty much for naught because it was so cold. Mm -hmm. But we're back trapping again this week, and uh, hopefully, hopefully okay. we'll uh, we'll finish it up. All so, right. So we got to stand out this video. We got to edit it. We got about a four minute video, and it's fascinating watching this. So let's Jeff. Let's go ahead and roll this video. Uh, he knows what I'm trying to do, and he's. He's buried his nose in the ground to keep me from getting the loop on him. Uh-oh. Here, whatever was looking because uh, the uh, other big one that uh, we told you that was running around in the yard. Yes, ma'am. Well, I believe she's going to be a female. Really? This one is because uh, my daughter, she got online and looked up some stuff yesterday about the breeding process and uh -huh. how long about the eggs and stuff. Because, uh, Jerry, you need me to help you. I see one of those big ones come out until uh, Greg started tearing down some of their stuff over here. Yes, ma'am. And then about three days later, he was out. Okay. Hold on, Jerry. Hold on just a minute. That's where the babies are. The other one's just recently. Over here in this wood pile. Mm-hmm. 
So, yeah. And like I said, my daughter and them, they, when they come out here to look, they believe they've seen another one in here. Huh. Miss Rita, yeah. do you see a bag right out there? Yes, I do. Could you throw it over here to me? This is a twist on it to where you can't get the bag off. I mean, the... All right, I got it loose. Okay. He won't turn loose of the pole now. Is he biting it? Or no, she? It's just wrapped around it like a like a python. Jerry, what is that one? Three feet long? Yeah. At least. Probably three and three. Ready? Yeah, go ahead. That is a big one. What will he weigh? 15 or 20 pounds, Jerry? Oh, yeah, at least 25. Oop. Look at his dog. See where he wraps? Yep. Yeah. from the Department of Agriculture up in Gainesville. So what you do is, you, same thing, you put like eggs in the back. There's a little trap door, the tegu goes in. He gets inside, get the egg, the door shut, so you can't push the door back out. So he's caught in there, and then the person can open, like, safely remove it. Yeah, but if these tegus are bigger than that. <laughs> It'll work. I have my assurances. And so you caught him through a trap? We actually got him by hand. Oh, by hand. He was sitting under a board over there. Yeah. Gonna push the shell through. Yeah. All right, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that. It was amazing at the size of those things. They're just they're just scary looking. Yeah, they, and and they are. They and they're looking everywhere. Jerry's pretty fearless. He looks under all kinds of stuff for them. And yeah. uh, and he, even while we were there the other day, one ran through the yard. We couldn't <laughs> catch him, but I think Jerry went back and caught him the Boy, next day. That's why these science fiction movies. See, you know it things? is. It all is. right, let's let's move along. Let's look at our our fishing forecast today. Brought to us by Mark Coward at Edgewater Beach Realty, eight three two six thousand. Mark's going to be fishing a big tournament this week uh, or next week at Nick's Redfish Roundup. And good luck on that, Mark. Okay, our times twelve oh three a.m. to two oh three a.m. That's midnight. But then right here in the middle of the day, twelve twenty six to two twenty six. That's a good time right there. Okay. Uh, now let's talk about gators real quick, Stan. Well, we're getting a, a lot of calls. People uh, are, are, seem to be jazzed up about the upcoming alligator uh, hunting season. Of course, we're in the application period right now. I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. Florida's second only to Louisiana in the southeastern states that issue permits for alligators. We're issuing five, roughly 5,000 permits. Uh, we will probably get two to three times the number of people that apply. So uh, you need to get your name in the hat if, uh, and get your application in if you're interested. It's $272 uh, to, for a resident here in Florida. If you're a non-resident, it's $1,022. Each permit allows you to take two alligators. Uh, the alligators have to be just bigger than 18 inches. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, and so it can be a four footer, it can be a eight, uh, you know, couple of eight footers or nine footer, whatever, but you're allowed. You're given two tags uh, and those alligators have to be tagged. Anybody that goes with you in the boat 
has to have a $50 agent's license if they're going to help you. If they're just going to sit there with their arms folded and not help you, they don't need anything. Okay. But if they're going to help in any way, they've got to have an agent's license. So mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a, a great recreational hunt. We have an abundant alligator population. Uh, in fact, a lot of people think we kill more than we do, but with a population in excess of a million animals here in the state, um, on average, we kill somewhere around 20,000. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we've got a, as you can tell, we've got a, we've got a, a good, abundant, growing alli alligator population um, harvest, but, but it's not such that, yeah. you know, that their uh, numbers are, de are, would, are depressed through hunting. So anyway. All right. Well, that, that sounds good. Yeah. And you need to get this first application period, Winston, I'm sorry, first application period ends May the 12th. So uh, if you need to go ahead and go to your uh, tax collector's office or sub-agent, uh, uh, Walmarts uh, of the world, uh, those kind of places where you can file your application. Okay. okay? All right. All right, we've got a minute or two left. Uh, any other any closing comments? Uh, or any, uh, well, Winston, uh, uh, the um, red snapper season is rapidly approaching. Uh, I saw some photos uh, just a few days ago of a person who actually went out. I think it was a group that went out. And we're targeting red snapper a few days ago in shallow water, hook and line, and they had them suspended in the column, mm -hmm. a water column, up to the boat. You could literally, uh, I'm told, you could see red snapper from just below the surface down to 40 feet or so, and they were just catching them and releasing them. But uh, uh, you can't, of course, the, the season comes in June 1. Uh, we, we have a 44-day season. Uh, Florida's uh, season is inconsistent with the federal season. We'll see what that federal season is. It hasn't been announced yet, uh, but uh, Florida, Louisiana, and Texas have seasons that are that are substantially longer than what was proposed by the by the uh, by the um, uh, by NIMS or, or not National uh, NOAA rather. Okay. So anyway. All right. Well, Stan, buddy, good show today. Appreciate Thank you. It. Thank you, Winston. A lot Thanks of good for information. And, uh, tell everybody to watch out for those big lizards. <laughs> okay? Yeah, yeah. All, right. All right, folks, as always, thank you for watching Panhandle Outdoors. We appreciate your viewership. Make sure you do something good for somebody today. And God bless. Thanks for joining us for Panhandle Outdoors with Winston Chester. Panhandle Outdoors features hunting, fishing, and other activities and information to help you enjoy the great outdoors. Join us next time for Panhandle Outdoors.